and welcome here from the Nanovig Institute for European Studies at the University of Notre Dame. Some of you may have watched the screening of Meeting Gorbachev in real time. Others may have joined us for the panel to discuss the film right now. Welcome all. My name is Clement Setmak and I serve as interim director of the Nanovic Institute. After this amazing and touching film, we are now moving into a discussion. The legendary film director, Werner Herzog, will join us for this event. In fact, he's at the center of it. This discussion will be moderated by Professor Josh Lund. Before I introduce Professor Lund, may I please explain the choreography of this afternoon panel. Professor Lund will introduce film director Werner Herzog. Werner Herzog will then offer some comments or remarks. After that, Professor Lund will moderate questions for Mr. Herzog in a discussion that will include students and also Professor Tim McAdams, who graciously gave a very deep and thought-provoking introduction to the film before the screening. Please feel free to ask questions through the Q&A button. Professor Lund will work with these questions and will also be the timekeeper. Enjoy the panel with its moderator, Professor Lund. May I now please introduce your very moderator. Joshua Lund is a Nanovic faculty fellow. He's also a professor of Spanish here at the University of Notre Dame. He's an internationally renowned Latin Americanist with a special interest in film. He's also a great colleague who is generous in sharing his gifts. Why have we asked him to chair the discussion? Well, he's the author of a 2020 book, Werner Herzog, American Nomadic. In a review of this remarkable book, we read, from the fascinating films of Werner Herzog, Joshua Lund crafts a striking book that sheds light on the political significance of a range of aesthetic issues. So no one is better placed to moderate this discussion on the film Meeting Gorbachev than Josh Lund. Dear Josh, thank you so much for being here and doing this. The floor is yours. Thanks, Clemens. That was really nice. Um, it is an honor and a thrill to welcome Werner Herzog to the Nanovic Institute of European Studies at the University of Notre Dame. And it's a real treat for me personally, as you can imagine, to introduce him to you. Uh, even if Werner Herzog, as the old saying goes, uh, needs no introduction. You know that Werner Herzog is a filmmaker and you know I have a lot of uh, notes here to work through about the significance of a range of his films. But given what we just saw, which was just such a touching and tremendous portrait, not only of Mikhail Gorbachev, but, but of our world really, um, I just want to note here how personally moved I was by the, uh, the images of the falling of the walls in, uh, in an era when everybody seems to be interested in building walls. Uh, I thought that was very profound. Um, so rather than get into uh, Herzog's films, which uh, Jim already did beautifully and uh, whose sentiment I echo 100%, let me just remind you that Werner Herzog is a man of many talents. I think Jim posed the question at the beginning, has he actually put out more than 70 films at this point? And I think the answer to that question is yes. Uh, starting from his some short films in the mid sixties uh, and then with his beautiful first feature called uh, Signs of Life a uh, black and white film shot, if I remember right, on the island of Kos. And that brings us all the way till today. I think in the last year, Werner Herzog has put out three new films, the acclaimed family romance, LLC, which was Werner's first film in Japanese, Nomad about the writer and Herzog's friend, Bruce Chatwin, and Fireball, which is about meteors and comets and their impact on human culture. Soon I hope that Werner will bring Fordlandia to fruition, which I understand is under, uh, is in pre-production and which would bring Werner Herzog back to the Amazon. Werner Herzog's storytelling talents don't stop at films. He's directed well over a dozen, maybe a couple dozen operas at some of the major companies around the world. He's an educator, including his own rogue film school in which students learn the arts of filmmaking, of course, but also lock picking, 
document forging and bare knuckle boxing. He's a world renowned narrator. His voice, uh, his voice work spans his own films, other feature shows, animated series, and so on. And he's an actor, really good at playing the bad guy. You might have seen him in recent years alongside Tom Cruise. And yes, I have to mention it, Baby Yoda, whose real name, I guess it turns out to be something like Grogu, which surprised me. Uh, Werner Herzog is also an author and the next year we'll see the publication of two new books. One, uh, the first coming out this September called The Twilight World. And then later next year, Every Man for Himself and God Against All. Finally, I'll note that Werner Herzog, something that I've always appreciated having been interested in Herzog's films for a few decades now. Werner Herzog has a great sense of humor. It comes up in his films. I'm sure we all remember the counterpoint that we just saw between the fall of the Iron Curtain and the news story about the slugs. And there's a sizable canon of Herzog outtakes and interviews on YouTube. I highly recommend that you check them out. Think about searching, entering the search words, Werner Herzog gets shot, true story. Werner Herzog vegetarian, Werner Herzog on internet trolls, or Werner Herzog eats his shoe. Another true story, which I believe had something to do with a lost bet. Werner, you are a living legend and we are really, really, really happy to welcome you to the Nanovic and Notre Dame and to discuss with you your remarkable portrait of Mikhail Gorbachev. Uh, very good to be with you. Um, I thank you for the invitation, but I have to do something um, uh, correcting a little bit. It's not just my film, it's a film by Andre Singer and Werner Herzog. We should not leave Andre Singer out. In fact, it was his project. Uh, and he approached me, he said, well, I'm planning to do a film on Mikhail Gorbachev. And uh, now I don't know how, how can I do the uh, conversations with him. We have everything set in place, but he uh, felt a little bit insecure because he uh, uses hearing a tenuous translation from English into Russian and from Russian into English. So with uh, all these kind of buttons in his ears, he, he didn't feel comfortable. And he said, well, uh, can you take that for me? Can you do that? Uh, and of course, we have had a long um, history of uh, collaborations, films together, adventures together, uh, beautiful uh, things in life together. And I said, of course, uh, Andre, uh, I'm the right choice because I love Gorbachev and I declare myself vis-a-vis -vis Gorbachev Germans and I in particular love him because of his role in uh, uh, the reunification of, of Germany. And <clears throat> gradually I worked myself more and more into it. And um, I had the feeling that um, uh, it became, it, it grew more and more towards me. And then I said, I would like to write the commentary as well, speak the commentary. And it became more a film that has my kind of, um, my kind of, of soul in it as well. But of course, it was a film that uh, where I said, it should not be just a political film. I would like to do something more. I want to look into the soul of a man, Gorbachev. And you see it very clearly when he meets his aunt towards the end of the film, for example. And it's not only the soul of a man, it's also in a way an attempt to look into the soul of a whole country, of a whole nation. Russia. And this is why, um, why he uh, recites uh, this poem by Lermontov. And I even repeat it 
in a in a scroll at the end once more because I had the feeling it was so deep about Russia. So it's it's a project of Andre Singer and it's a project uh, of me, and we have to we have to keep the balance right. Thank you, Werner. We have a whole range of questions lined up for you. The first one is going to be presented by. Uh, I should note, we always start at the Nanovic with questions from students, because ultimately that's why we're here. Uh, Ellen O'Brien is a senior uh, majoring in film, theater, and television, and she's here to pose the first question. Ellen, I think you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi. First, I just want to start off and say, as a film student, it means so much to me to have you here and to get the opportunity to speak to you, Mr. Herzog. So thank you for doing this. Um, my question for you is how did Gorbachev challenge you or surprise you as a filmmaker and a documentarian? Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you, you're very kind. Uh, Gorbachev, I think was very well prepared. He knew I was coming and he had apparently seen some of my films and he was told uh, about uh, the fact I traveled on foot around my own country. Um, when uh, German politics abandoned the quest for reunification of my country, um, I, um, as a gesture, of rebellion against that trend of the time, started to travel the very borderline of my country. And I wanted to surround it in order to hold it together, like with a belt. And our language, our culture was what would um, keep us together. And Gorbachev knew about it. And of course, he was a man on foot. As you have seen in the film, he has traveled on foot, even as a fairly high-ranking communist apparatchik. He came on foot to far out uh, outposts, kolchoses and um, uh, settlements and villages, and nobody had done it before. And we had many things in common. Uh, he knew what hunger was after the war, and I knew what hunger was. I know what it means to be to be hungry. And we both uh, came from similar backgrounds, from the real periphery, the farthest corner of the country. And we were very much self-taught. And so there were many things that were in, in common and that immediately gave a common ground. And I was completely unafraid. No matter what was gonna come, I was going to deal with it. And of course, um, he is always a surprise, always uh, somebody who um, makes strange long pauses. You want to ask, you want to, you, you think he's done with it. And, and I, I had to rein myself in. All of a sudden, after a long pause, there comes an afterthought, which is even more important. And, um, so uh, I think uh, that there was an there was an almost instantaneous trust between us, and so every single surprise that would come at me uh, was was something I would accept. Very easy, you see. If if you do a film like that, you are a young filmmaker. If you do a film like that, um, don't come with a. With with prepared statements and prepared list of questions. Yes, I was well prepared. I read his autobiography. I spoke with people who knew him well. I read speeches. I read uh, uh, God knows what. So I, I, I read different versions um, of um, transcripts of, uh, Supreme, of the Supreme Soviet before he was elected. Uh, uh, elected leader of the party. So you come well prepared, but put the paper aside. And then uh, uh, you, you have one task, dig as deep as you can, as quickly as you can. 
and be completely unafraid. That's great. Thank you so much. Werner, next we have uh, Sarah Crane. She is a Nanovic graduate fellow. She's a PhD student in the Kroc Institute in History and Peace Studies. Sarah, you can unmute yourself and go ahead with your question for Werner. Hello, Herr Herzog. Schön, Sie kennen Sie lernen. I have a question about your portrayal of Mr. Gorbachev in the film. Many of the questions that you ask him are, are not just about the events of the past, but the implication of those events and his words about those events in the present. And I wanna ask about this kind of dual aim of portraying a man with insight in the past, as well as a man with implications for the present and how you aim to kind of balance those two in your interview and in your construction of the film. Thank you. Well, that was always in, in the back of my mind. Uh, yes, it's easy to, to be encyclopedic and, and be biographical and tell his life from beginning to end. So, I mean, thanks God, he's still alive. He's just turned 92 days ago, I think. Uh, and I think we should all congratulate him here that he uh, <laughs> is still around and, uh, and alert and curious. But in the back of my mind was always, what is Russia today? What has it been? What, what is it today or the Soviet Union? What, what are the implications for today? And I saw it with great uh, uh, concern and alarm that the previous administrations canceled the short and medium range missile treaty that was between the Soviet Union and the following uh, country, Russia, and in the West. And um, now uh, I'm delighted that at least for five years, this treaty, this treaty will be still in effect. President Biden has made very clear declarations. And people always ask me, yeah, why is it so important? Yes, it is important because it's an entire, very, very dangerous class of weapons. Uh, you have to imagine when you have, um, if you want to attack Russia and you fire uh, intercontinental missile from let's say, God knows, uh, North, North Dakota across the Arctic, Arctic uh, into Russia. It takes uh, 13, 14 minutes until it arrives and impacts. And we have had cases where there was false alarms. And there was a colonel, a Russian colonel, I forgot his name, um, a wonderful man uh, who was alarmed. We have to respond. There's an entire squadron of intercontinental missiles coming at us. And he said, no, stop. We have a moment of time. Let's ask, what does the radar in Sakhalin Island tell us? What is the radar telling us in Novaya Semlya? What is the radar telling us here and there? And all of a sudden it turns out it's a flock of geese. It's a formation of wild geese that was misread by the, uh, uh, by, <laughs> by by the radar in the surveillance and and now this this class of weapons if you launch a, a missile a short range or medium range missile let's say from paris and you want to hit the men's room in the kremlin which you can uh, it takes 210 seconds from launch until until impact there's no time of reflection. There's no time of ver verification. It's a very, very dangerous uh, class of weapons and delivery systems. So, um, and of course, the um, treaty that followed the uh, conversations between and Gorbachev made it possible that these uh, weapons were eliminated, these delivery systems were eliminated. And, and I, um, I also uh, have always in, in the back of my mind, 
what has Russian be, Russia been? And I have been in Russia, always working, by the way, as I was never a tourist in Russia. I worked as an actor. I made films, I made a film in Russia myself. Um, I have been around always with the people working. And I have seen the, the destitution and misery uh, that came after Gorbachev when Yeltsin uh, took over. The, the collapse, the internal collapse of an entire system and the, and the hopelessness of the misery of the people and how does it develop? And it has developed in a, in a fairly good direction. And I, I find it a, a massive monumental mistake to demonize Russia as it happens right now. Russia is not a danger for America. It's not going to attack America. Russia is not going to attack Germany, Italy, France, or, or Sweden. They're not gonna do that. It's not in their interest. And you have to read the, the uh, as you are politically involved, of course, read the uh, statements or read the entire speech that uh, Vladimir Putin uh, delivered at the uh, security conference in Munich in 2007, 14 years back. And he declared himself very, very uh, clearly, and it had to do with the expansion of NATO. NATO, and that was a false promise, and that's one of the, one of the tragedies of uh, Gorbachev. The promise was there, you are giving up uh, a Warsaw Pact, before it was dismantled, he even pulled out 500,000 troops, 5,000 tanks, then dissolved, uh, uh, then the Warsaw Pact was dissolved. And uh, NATO countries promised, we will not expand beyond where we are right now. And they did. And Russia finds it, Russia finds it, this is an existential threat. And it's not that Vladimir Putin finds it an existential threat. threat. Yes, he does. But I think 66%, two thirds of ordinary Russian city, citizens find the NATO expansions directly to their borders as an existential threat. And, and you, you have to be a little bit imaginative. Imagine, imagine that, uh, for example, if you reverse the scenario, imagine that NATO is abolished and all of a sudden Russian and Canadian troops, 200,000 of them are um, doing um, maneuvers at the American border in Saskatchewan. At the same time, two aircraft carriers at moored at Tijuana, 50,000 Russian troops stationed in Jamaica, smoking weed and drinking rum uh, and, and having a good time. Uh, and Russian bases in Iceland. So my question is, would America not feel existentially threatened? Mm. So in these questions, of course, were always in the back of my of my head when I spoke to Mikhail Gorbachev. In that sense, he very much bridges past and present. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. That was a great question. Yes, of course. Thank you, Werner, for the answer. Werner, next up we have uh, Will Forsen. He's a sophomore majoring in global affairs and the program for liberal studies. Will, go ahead. Herzlich willkommen by Notre Dame, Herr Herzog. My father is, uh, is watching from back home and he is a great fan of your works, especially Fitzcarraldo. But my question pertains Thank to your you. conversations with Gorbachev. Specifically, how did you mentally prepare for your conversations with him? And how did that differ from other people you've interviewed? Well, it's not interviews. I'm not a journalist, and I, I said it to Gorbachev right away. You are not going to meet uh, 
a journalist. I don't have any questions. I don't have a catalog. Beware, as Michael Sergeyevich, beware, you're going to talk to a poet. So, and he laughed and he said, I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah. So, um, that's, that's a basic attitude that, that I had. And he tried to, he tried to somehow um, find a common ground with me, uh, even a common, let's say, dress code. In three occasions when we met, actually we had only two occasions to meet, but uh, abruptly he summoned me back for a third meeting. We had a last meeting where we bring him this, uh, uh, eggs and the chocolate cake. Um, but in, in these two uh, official sort of sessions, um, it was always clear um, we try to, to find, without uh, speaking about it, we try to, to find some sort of a common ground we have similar experience, post-war experiences. Uh, we know what hunger is. We know what, uh, uh, what the, the danger and the collapse of a nation could be like Germany, the of Germany. And it's, it's very strange because I showed up with a formal suit, but no tie, a dark shirt. And he had arrived with a, I think with a tie and suit and very, very formal. And, and he asked for some time out before we turned on uh, our cameras and he disappeared and he came in, in a different dress, a, a, a formal jacket, some sort of a turtleneck uh, shirt. So he wanted to be somehow on equal terms, even in our dress code. And it, it really touched me deep. He didn't want me to, to look inferior because I didn't wear a tie. And um, so I, I could read the signals and uh, uh, we sometimes, you see the first two sessions that we had um, uh, are intercut because sometimes we would speak about NATO and he would speak in the first session and in the second session. Second session, he came straight from hospital. He was, each time he was delivered in an ambulance to his uh, foundation, to the headquarters and taken back by ambulance to the hospital. And in one of these, in the second session, he still had his uh, uh, a needle for this intravenous drip uh, and it was covered by a bandage. And sometimes from one cut to the next, he all of a sudden has a bandage. So, and, uh, and we said to ourselves, we accept the, no matter what, how he looks like, no matter um, if, uh, if the film um, doesn't have a full continuity, we accept it all. And he accepted my, um, let's say, sometimes incoherent questions. And I sometimes uh, accepted his impulsive answers. And uh, it was a wonderful way to, to have a deep conversation. Well, thank you. That was a great question. Uh, Werner, uh, next up we have uh, uh, the William Scholl Professor of International Affairs, uh, Jim McAdams, who you'll recall began, uh, introduced yeah. the film with a very uh, eloquent and uh, profound uh, meditation on your films. Jim, take it away. Oh, oh I saw uh, the introduction thing. Sure. <laughs> Hello. Hey, Hansog, uh, I, I, one part of your film, there were several that struck me in exactly the same way, uh, but in one in particular, you said to Gorbachev, I love you because reunification was so important to me. And I found this um, uh, almost shocking, the way that you said it, uh, in its the sense that it was eye-opening. Um, I happened to be living in both East Berlin and Bonn in 1987 and 1988. 
and to speak mm -hmm. about Bonn in particular, uh, I met virtually nobody who uh, not only who treated unification as you know unrealistic, but uh, very few people who were anxious to figure out a way to unify Germany, and including Horst Telchik, whom you interviewed. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering about your love for Germany and uh, your walk around Germany. Uh, was this a passion that you had throughout your life? Uh, was it a passion that you acquired uh, after 1989? Where did it come from? Well, that's a very deep question and uh, superficially I can answer it first. Um, I'm not a German nationalist. That's, I knew um, and you know Germany, of course, uh, intimately. Um, we do have something in common. Uh, our great literature, Hölderlin, Kleist, Büchner, Kafka, you just name it. And we have our great composers and the philosophers, and there's some sort of a, of a deep interior entity which uh, has been broken apart and fragmented. Germany was not only separated and cut into two parts, <clears throat> East and West, of course, some parts were, some chunks were taken away and became France, like the Elsass region around Strasbourg. Uh, some parts of Germany, of course, uh, were lost to the Czech Republic or Czechoslovakia. Some of it to Poland. Kaliningrad was back, um, uh, before. So, of course, all these big cataclysmic events uh, require new thinking about, about borders. And the borders are not that important. I think the, the importance is the, the collect, collective experience as a nation without being narrow-mindedly and dangerously nat nationalist as the Germans have been in the past. And they have triggered catastrophes upon the rest of the world and in particular upon, upon Russia. We should not forget that 25 million 26, maybe 27 million Russian people lost their lives because of the German uh, imposed war on them. And um, so, um, and of course I say, of, of course we Germans love you and I love you in particular because the reunification was important for me. It's a cultural thing and and it's the same thing I think uh, we, we have to hope for uh, Ireland. Uh, Ireland still step with it, will one day have, and you have this wonderful Irish culture of storytelling, of poetry, of music, uh, of, of connectedness. And I, hope, I have the same hope for Korea and, and I'm not just saying that I have worked in North Korea. Of all places, I've made part of a film in North Korea. And, and there's this very, very strong, same sort of uh, sentiment, this strong longing of reunifications. And it's, I think, in the North Koreans with greater intensity than the South Koreans. So, and... Um, I had a, feel, a feeling that I had to out myself, not only to him, but also to the audiences. I'm not trying to be a, an objective sort of journalist, uh, a journalist who, who asks a question and then closes the book. Thank you for the interview. It is a meeting. It's a meeting. It's a concordance of hearts. It's a curiosity that both of us have vis-a-vis -vis the world. It's a worldview that we try to share. Thank you, Jim. Uh, next question, uh, Xander Shine is a, is a junior 
who is uh, minoring in European studies and majoring in mechanical engineering. Uh, Xander? That's interesting. Very interesting combination. <laughs> I uh, wanted to bring in some humanities with the engineering. I definitely yeah. but, uh, I wanted to thank you, Mr. Herzog, for uh, all of your work. Um, I actually recently started watching the master class you did on filmmaking, and uh, I loved seeing your cameos, especially the one in Parks and Recreation. <laughs> um, so, as mentioned in the introduction uh, to this panel, many of your films focus on the humanity of the main subject and their relationship to their surroundings and to nature. How do you see the theme of nature and humanity take shape differently in this film than in some of your others? Well, it is in a way a, a, an unusual film where, but not unusual because I try to look very deep into the soul of a person or the soul of his whole country. But um, it has nothing to do with nature, it has, uh, but it has to do with my, with, with my intense curiosity about the world. And it, I share my worldview to some degree with Gorbachev. And uh, I try to scrutinize uh, the, um, state, the status of, of our uh, human existence right now. Um, and of course, Gorbachev is a wonderful, uh, a wonderful partner in crime in this case, because he shaped the world. He's not only a citizen of the world, he shaped it more than uh, anyone that I have ever met in my life. So <clears throat> it's, and, and of course you have to see it again, uh, against the um, uh, background that uh, it's a project that was brought to me by Andre Singer. And I immediately recognized, oh my God, yes, this is my project as well. So <laughs> I, I started to usurp it, but, but it was an unusual, it had an unusual genesis and it is in a way an unusual film but it's not as unusual as you may think if, if you look, for example, at uh, Into the Abyss, uh, it's about uh, death row inmate or inmates, a series on, uh, of films on uh, inmates on death row waiting for execution and the same curiosity to look very deep into the human condition, what, what manifests itself there and um, it's the same sort of, of curious look into history, into a man who shaped history. Thank you, Xander. Uh, next up, and uh, all thanks to, to Werner Herzog for spending this time with us uh, and for reflecting on the issues that, that come up in this film, which are, um, which are world historical indeed and speak to our, our contemporary world as well. Um, depending on time, this might be our last question and it looks like it's gonna be a good one. Uh, Madeline Filak is a research assistant with the Nanovic Institute and she majors in political science and pre-health. Madeline, are you there? Here she comes. Yes, sorry, I took my no computer problem. to load. You're good. Um, yes, hi, Mr. Herzog. Thank you for being here today. Um, I was curious as to whether Gorbachev ever expressed what drove his conviction in communism, despite the obvious failings of the state that he himself saw by traveling the country and experiencing them in daily life. Well, we did not speak directly about it, uh, but um, he mentions once that he uh, wanted to have more democracy, but also more communism, which doesn't have to be a contradiction per se. It, not inherently, I would say that's a contradiction. Um, and I do believe uh, we speak about it and we speak about it um, when... Um, uh, we discussed Chernobyl. Chernobyl was for him the wake up moment 
where he saw the entire system was, was not functioning. Uh, his own uh, president of the uh, Academy of Sciences told him, oh, that's a, just a minor thing. And we, we drink a few vodkas and sleep it off. The president of the Academy of Sciences said that to him. And um, uh, the, the entire system of uh, um, making things transparent and causing a catastrophe that could have been prevented easily uh, if the mechanisms had been performed with greater diligence. And I do believe that uh, he didn't give up communism, but he wanted to uh, uh, very, very clearly to transform the entire system. He believed in the transformation of the system. And of course, it turned out the system itself could not be uh, reformed or transformed into, uh, into some, some different structure. So, and, and that makes him tragic at the same time. But I think you may have something, uh, I may have overheard, not heard some, some deeper meaning in your question. Can you articulate it again? Yes, I was just, to me, it was very curious that um, Gorbachev experienced, you know, um, hu like extreme hunger and he, like, he saw the poverty and the corruption um, very clearly. And, but also at the same time, there's this tension because one does not become like the party secretary of the communist party without being an absolute ideologue. And so to me, I was just wondering if he ever expressed what like, what made him believe so strongly in communism, despite the really obvious failings that he experienced. Uh, I do believe he's still a communist deep in his heart. He has not given up uh, his beliefs. Of course, it, it, is, uh, it is a utopian, a utopian belief that did not work in the real world. And we have seen, we have seen the demise of utopian ideas in the 20th century, the big utopians, social utopians, the social utopia of the Nazis, of a master race that would dominate the, the rest of the planet and, and it would be a beautiful, pure planet of, of, of great uh, uh, communalities and uh, I mean, completely dangerous and absurd uh, and has led to catastrophes. The same uh, way uh, communism paradise on earth uh, it, it has been a utopia and it has been discarded in a way in the 20th century. But the ideas, the ideas, uh, the idea of communism or a socialism where uh, con consuming goods and becoming richer and richer is not the, the, the pivot and meaning of all um, private and public life. So, and, and that's a dangerous, we are slipping into a, or have slipped into a, a, a dangerous way of um, uh, consumerism. And we are destroying because of the consumerism, we are destroying our planet. Um, and Gorbachev sees that and, and he still sees the values of, of the idea of communism and that it was not uh, really transform transformative for an entire for an entire uh, civilization, but deep in his heart, I think he has never abandoned the utopia, the utopian thinking of communism. Okay, thank you, Werner. We're at the end of our time. Uh, your eloquence on these issues, I'm sure we could keep listening to you for the rest of the evening, but we don't want to uh, impose on you. Is there any kind of a concluding remark that you would like to uh, leave us with regarding uh, your work on this film and your interactions with Mikhail Gorbachev? Well, it's uh, an idea to, for the future, of course, 
Gorbachev was so warm, warmly received by the West uh, as if he were the mascot of the West and, and he was deceived by the West. And I'm, when I speak of deceived by the West that uh, um, uh, the West never accepted his uh, uh, drawing back of troops uh, and that uh, the um, Warsaw Pact has been dismantled. All these are things that um, uh, have not been really good for, for the Soviet Union and now for, for Russia. My hope is that um, um, there can't be a reset uh, of political reapproachment between the West and, and Russia. That, that's not going to happen. But I think there should be a very sober look at each other. And I do believe that, uh, again, I do believe that the demonization of Russia is a mistake. And the West should step back from that and take a sober look. What is there? What do we have in other countries? Um, who, is, uh, who is a manifest danger for us and who is not? So, and, and just a very sober, a sober new thinking and approach of the real world as it is right now uh, would be helpful. Werner, thank you so much for being with us this afternoon. Your work uh, inspires us. Uh, the film uh, that you that we presented today on Mikhail Gorbachev gives us a lot to think about in your elaborations on what went into it and what it provoked you to think about. Uh, uh, we really appreciate your sharing that with us. Thank you, Werner. Thank you and goodbye. Thanks to everybody who participated in this special screening of Werner Herzog's meeting Mikhail Gorbachev with the Nanobek Institute at the University of Notre Dame.